think what you'll hear today from this distinguished panel is that this doctors are struggling to find out what test to do in what patient and how to interpret it. And at the same time, other doctors are trying to find out what are the gaps? What more do we need to know? Where does research need to take us so that we can diagnose cancer every time without uh, over-treating people who really don't have a serious problem <coughs> or under-treating uh, people uh, because the cancer because the, di the diagnostic test was inaccurate, we call it false negative. We want to get rid of the false negatives and the false positives and be accurate every time if possible. That's the goal, uh, long-term goal. Short-term goal today is to provide practical advice to those of you out there uh, here in the uh, congressional hearing room and to those of you watching on, on uh, the web uh, as to what you and your doctor can do to make sure you get the best care today. However, uh, it's, there's no question that the PSA is useful in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. Uh, it's elevated in multiple conditions, uh, in inflammation of the prostate, in enlargement of the prostate, and in cancer of the prostate, in about equal proportions, but it's clearly a leading uh, parameter to consider when diagnosing with men with prostate cancer, and in addition, it's highly uh, uh, useful in managing patients after their principal treatment. Uh, at the time uh, before PSA, when we would diagnose a man with prostate cancer, 75 or 80 percent of the time the cancer was metastatic. Uh, in other words, in a state which was uh, relatively incurable. Uh, today, about 10 percent to 15 percent of patients are diagnosed in the metastatic state. So we've clearly moved the pendulum towards early detection. That comes with a price. Uh, the price has been uh, the fact that we believe that we are overdiagnosing this cancer somewhat because of the limitations of the technology and the information we have. And certainly, a PSA is not a perfect test. It's not even a cancer-specific biomarker. And we definitely need better research and better ways to deal with it. But I do not think we should abandon the PSA, nor should we demonize it. It's been a heroic, a, a heroic a feature in the ability to reduce the death rate for prostate cancer. An elevated PSA uh, does not mean prostate cancer. It means a prostate uh, uh, disease is present. Skip. And the people that are best informed about this are the doctors that live in this world and deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I don't think there's any substitution for the doctor-patient relationship, nor will there ever be. You know, the argument against screening is that it may produce unnecessary testing, uh, unnecessary suffering, uh, um, uh, unnecessary biopsies, and, and possibly even unnecessary treatments, although we're not capable of determining what's unnecessary or not till that long after the fact. But one thing that occurred to me and, and just triggered by your comment was I mentioned that if you, if you practice urology and you use the best information that's currently available, and you do biopsies on men with elevated PSAs, uh, the national average is that about 37 or 38 percent of them are positive, uh, assuming that all doctors are using the same criteria, which roughly speaking they are. That means roughly two-thirds of the patients who have biopsies have negative biopsies, and therefore, in retrospect, they were unnecessary. Uh, and I, I would have to say, as somebody that does biopsies and two-thirds of them being unnecessary, I have never had a patient who said, I'm really sorry you did that biopsy on me because it was kind of uncomfortable uh, and obviously unnecessary. Patients, when they get a negative biopsy, are not upset that they had an unnecessary test. They're very grateful that they had an unnecessary test that proved to be negative. And I think that's, that doesn't come through in the discussions. The fact that we use this marker and we're identifying people earlier, it's impacting mortality, the number of people that die from the disease. And I think you pointed out that I'm not aware of any single marker or any test at all that's changed a cancer type the way PSA is done. Um, so the data is real. We've impacted in 20 or 30 years the whole face of prostate cancer with the use of this test. The more data we have, the more you can have intelligent conversations with your physician about when you should get a biopsy, should you not. 
what's normal for you, you know. Um, and I think, you know, again, because we're not sure of all the aspects of it, um, you could either be afraid and say we're not going to pay attention to any of the data that's out there, or we can be more logical and say we have a test that's shown to be valuable. It's changed the face of this disease. It has information that's good in making decisions on what to do. Um, let's use it, but let's improve it through new technologies. Well, the, the PSA test uh, stands for prostate specific. Not, it doesn't stand for prostate cancer specific. And that's the problem. If we are someday to have a test that says you have prostate cancer and this is the kind you have, then we're <coughs> going to need to have something other than what is, we're talking about today. Um, there's new markers that are going to be, I think, coming to the prostate cancer arena in the next year, uh, over the next five years, and, and maybe even uh, in the next ten years. And I think we'll see a series of these. You know, in, in the short term, we're going to see new iterations of PSA, a uh, molecule called pro-PSA, which is a precursor form of it, um, that seems to, again, not replace PSA, but make it better uh, than the PSA that we're using today, a little more accurate at defining uh, what Dr. Holden pointed out, which is really one of our key questions, which is what are the, the bad prostate cancers, the ones that are going to be aggressive, that may be life-threatening, and separating them for those that uh, don't seem to have the potential uh, to become uh, life-disruptive and, and ones that we might be able to, to uh, treat through other means or maybe not treat at all. Um, uh, you know, we're going to, there's, there's tools like uh, PCA3, which is a molecule found in the urine. Um, this is an RNA, which is a nucleic acid not a you know, molecule we'd expect to find in the urine, but one that's found there uh, and seems to have some information uh, about what's going on in prostate cancer. So, uh, gentlemen, do you, I understand you to uh, mean that uh, the funding is adequate or inadequate for uh, improving on PSA testing? It's inadequate given the fact that we could give you a seminar on seven technologies right now seven as of today, um, which ought to be pushed forward and men ought to be uh, checked. And okay. there just, there isn't, it's been a flat budget in general, um, but it's, it's inadequate for this. Uh, so that part of the argument of uh, overdiagnosis can be mitigated by under treatment in an appropriate, when used in an appropriate way. The problem is we don't know what the appropriate way is. And so one of the things that Prostate Cancer Foundation has been very successful at doing is pointing to unmet needs within the scientific community for prostate cancer. And one of the unmet needs is to understand how active surveillance works. At Prostate Cancer Foundation, we're about to initiate a project which will be nationwide, which looks at men in active surveillance programs and it attempts to accumulate a large database so that any man that's diagnosed uh, in with prostate cancer who meets the criteria which we're going to hammer out for active surveillance will be able to have their tissue stored either on the East Coast at Johns Hopkins or the West Coast at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles and enter this large database which will be incredibly rich for mining uh, of, uh, for patients who go on with the, the tortoises and the hare scenario. Uh, this is essentially what was done in the Framingham study which led to so many uh, meaningful discoveries about cardiovascular disease which Dr. Cassell, Cassell well knows. Uh, and we're also going to uh, add a, a slightly different wrinkle to this that I don't think has ever been done either, uh, is to include a database of the male uh, offspring of men who have prostate cancer, which is a very enriched population of uh, people who have a higher than normal incidence of getting the disease. And we want to create a database where on a voluntary basis these uh, men uh, or young men uh, can enter their blood or tissue or their blood or, or urine specimens, not biopsies, but into a database which we will collect on a longitudinal basis and try to use it to determine which of this group actually develops prostate cancer or not and as a way to serve uh, to identify lifestyle changes, uh, dietary issues, things that may be beneficial to them with respect to prevention of prostate cancer. So we're going to be rolling out this project within the next month or so, and I think it's going to be a real outstanding accomplishment for this organization. Mm -hmm.